Greetings from the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. My name is Jonathan Schreier, and I am Chief of Mission at the Embassy. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth annual Jerusalem International Writers' Festival. The U.S. Embassy and our American Center Jerusalem are delighted to partner with our friends from Mishkanot Sha'ananim and to give our support to this festival that celebrates the art of writing in a time when we need it more than ever. As someone who has lived and worked in many countries, I've had the privilege of getting to know peoples of different cultures, different languages, different beliefs, and different lives. It is an important part of my job. It helps me to build the mutual understanding, respect, and trust between people that allows us to work together to achieve our shared goals. But I think what writers do, and what literature does, gives us deeper access to places, people, and times outside of our own experiences. During the pandemic, a book was often a source of refuge for me. To be enlightened, to be entertained, to seek escape from our isolation, and to be reconnected with humanity. Like Israel, the United States is a multicultural society which means we can read American authors who give us insights into a wide variety of cultural experiences and perspectives. Among the authors featured today, you have Avni Doshi, whose debut novel begins with the remarkable line, quote, I would be lying if I said my mother's misery has never given me pleasure. Harlan Corbin, who has over 70 million books in print, most of them bestsellers, and each one more devilishly captivating than the last. And Jonathan Safran Foer, whose fourth novel derives its title from one of my favorite biblical phrases, Hineni, or Here I Am. Thank you to Mishkanot Sha'ananim for putting together such a rich and fascinating program this year. I wish everyone a wonderful time at the festival and hope you find renewal and inspiration for better times ahead. Kol HaKavod. Hello and welcome to the Jerusalem Writers Festival in Mishkenot Shananim. Uh, my name is Doro Mishani and it's my great pleasure uh, to talk today to one of the most read writers in the world, Harlan Coban. Um, Harlan, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I wish I was actually uh, there. I wish I was actually yeah, there. And yeah, we wish to. But uh, not, not meant to be yet. Maybe next year. Next year in Jerusalem. <laughs> it's a, too, too obvious a line. Yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> the editor would make us change it because it's too much of a cliche. It's beautiful yeah. cliche, yeah. but I've heard it too often. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, you and your books don't really need an introduction, certainly not in Israel. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, but you're probably the most successful mystery or thriller writer in Israel for many years now. Um, I think most of your novels, if not all, uh, were translated to Hebrew, which is very, very rare here. Um, nevertheless, I will just say a few words of introduction, okay? Please. Um, so you were born in New Jersey in 1962. Your first novel, Play Dead, was published in 1990. And since then, you published more than 30 novels, some in the Myron Bolliter series, and most of them standalones. Uh, the most recent one, Win, is going to come out soon, right? Next week? Yes, in America, it comes out. There you are. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks. Yeah, so, uh, so Win will be able to read in English next week and in Hebrew probably in a few months, right? Yeah. Um, you've won many American and international crime fiction awards, and you're also responsible or involved in many successful TV series uh, such as The Five, The Woods, Safe, and uh, The Stranger. Um, so we'll try to talk about all that, Harlan, but, you know, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, but I want to start with your new book here in Israel, uh, The Boy from the Woods, uh, the book, because, you know, when this talk will be aired uh, during the festival, it will just come out in Hebrew. Great. Um, so tell us a bit about The Boy from the Woods. Well, the idea came from me to me, and this is a good example of how 
anything could lead to an idea. But a great deal of um, trying to find what you're going to write next is to constantly in your life ask, what if, what if, whatever I'm doing. So uh, I was hiking through the woods, the Appalachian Mountains in Northern New Jersey. People don't realize the famous Appalachian Mountains actually reach the state of New Jersey with my family. And I find hiking really boring. Um, you know, it's a tree and then there's another tree and then there's another tree. And I prefer to look at bookstores or window shop or watch people, but it was a lot of trees and I was getting bored and my mind was wandering. And I saw on a, on, a, on a parallel path, a young boy, maybe five or six years old, walking by himself. So I started to think, what if? What if this boy came out of the woods right now, six years old, let's say, and he claims he remembers no life but living in this woods. He remembers no parents. He's fended for himself. He broke into houses or, or ate off the land and just didn't know, you know, no, almost like a Tarzan or Mowgli kind of a figure, except that he educated himself when he broke into these houses. What if we find him now at the age of six? And what if 30 years pass and we still don't know how he got in those woods? And now another kid goes missing in the woods and he tries to find him. So that was the idea, uh, the start of what became the seed, the small seed that grows into yeah. uh, the book, The Boy from the Woods. And into this character, you know, fascinating character that is wild. In Hebrew, he's called Pere. So the word wild was just translated to Pere. Um, and what you do that is very interesting in the novel is you don't solve his mystery. I mean, you don't solve the, you don't bring us, you don't give us the solution for his backstory. Why, why did you do that? Is it because, um, you know, you intend to write another novel with him? or just because you like leaving unanswered questions? Well, no, uh, it's, it's kind of neither. Um, I'm writing a sequel right now, which is his origin story. The book mm -hmm. opens up, the one I'm writing right now, opens up with Wilde staring at his father. You know, mm -hmm. So he's, mm -hmm. he's figured it out, I'm getting right into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew, I know even when I was writing it, what Wilde's backstory is. But once we got into the heart of the mystery, which involves a lot of stuff that was, that's going on in America today and the world yeah. Yeah. and media manipulation and fake news. And it's probably my most political book at the end of the day. Um, there just wasn't room for it where it wouldn't have stuck out. And so that, uh, that really wasn't the main mystery. He's solving a crime of why these kids have gone missing. Yeah. And so I did know the answer. Uh, I'm running the answer now, but it, you know, you have to, you know, I think it was Hemingway or Faulkner who originally said, you have to kill all your darlings. So there's times you have to know when to go someplace and when not to. So this story is told, it's complete. You get all the answers um, and there'll be a second one with, uh, with Wild. Oh, great. Is it your next one after Win? After Win. Yep. I'm writing it right now. Okay. Um, some of the, th uh, the themes uh, in the novel are recurring themes in your books, and I, I want to ask you a bit about them. Um, so it starts with a high school student, a girl uh, going missing, and children often go missing in your books. Um, what is so dangerous about being a child in the world, in your novels? Or, uh, you know, to put it a bit differently, why is a child going missing such an appealing opening for a plot? Well, I've written, uh, I think, 32, 33 books. Mm -hmm. My guess is a, a child would go missing in maybe five of them, six mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. um, I always, I, missing people in general is what I write about. I tell yeah. no one is a missing person. The Stranger, which you may have seen on net, Netflix, yeah. is a missing person. Um, so most of my books actually are not necessarily missing children. In this case, it's a teenager, uh, but missing people. And I, I love missing people for a couple of reasons. But the main one is the same way I get the Christie wrote murder. I, missing people is my thing. That said, of course, Wynn has no missing people in it. <laughs> and the boy from the woods has no missing. The second one has no missing people. So who knows? Yeah. Um, but the thing about that theme that I like, if, if somebody's dead, they're dead. That's it. You're solving a crime. You can get justice and all of that, but they're dead. If somebody is missing, they may still be alive. Mm -hmm. The possibilities are endless. You could have full redemption. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, it tests it tests people and an audience in a way that I think a straight murder story, which has been also done a lot, has not. So years ago, I started doing missing people, and I found that way you have all of the things really that a murder story gives you, but you have that one added dimension where it would be great if that person um, was still alive, which is works for me to on a personal level. My father died fairly young. Uh, he was the same age I am now when he died. And of course, you can never have him back. But to all of you out there who have lost a loved one, we all have that moment or that maybe you have a dream at night where that person is still alive or that hope. So hope is a, is a really cool thing to write about because hope, you know, it can make your heart soar like it has wings or it could crush your heart like it's an eggshell. And that emotion, I think, helps when I write these books. Um, I don't want to reveal too much, but uh, the book's mystery has to do with a secret for from some of the characters' remote past. Um, and this is also, I think, a recurrent theme. I mean, seemingly normal people hide awful secrets. Where is this coming from? I mean, did you feel like that growing up, looking at the adults, that they're all hiding dark secrets? Well, there's two answers to that. Um, one is the Flaubert quote, which I'll get a little bit wrong, but Flaubert says to be ordinary and bourgeois in your real life so you can be violent and original mm -hmm. in your work. Be regular and bourgeois or normal uh, to be violent. So I'm, my own life, boring, really. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think one of the great parts of human nature that I explore very rarely directly but indirectly in almost every book is there's a part of human nature and I think everybody will relate to this, I hope so, that says, I'm uniquely complex. People really can't tell what I'm thinking, but I can tell what that person's thinking, right? We always know what that person's thinking, but they don't really know what I, what's inside of me. Everyone really, we don't know. Um, every time I walk down a street and you look at a house and a door, that's its own country. It's its own world. You may think you know what's going on in that household, but you don't might be better than you think, it might be worse than you think, but you don't know. Yeah. And that's something, again, that I think is compelling to write about and something we can all relate to. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that Wilde was, uh, you know, was growing up as an, almost as an animal in the woods. You know, we don't know a lot about his childhood. Maybe we will know in the next book. Um, and he's now living in a unique place, like a capsule um, in the forest. Um, but most of the books take place in what you often described in your novels, small towns, suburbs. Um, and I wanted to ask you about these spaces. Uh, I would say that you investigate in your novels the border between the suburb and the forest or the suburb and the woods. What is so fascinating or fertile about this border or proximity of the suburb and the woods? Well, add to it that it's also the proximity to a main city. Mm -hmm. um, my suburbs where I am right now and where this book takes place is a 45 minute drive maybe to New York City. People mm -hmm. live, you know, half hour from Tel Aviv. They say they're from Tel Aviv. But if you live in New Jersey, and you live a half hour from New York City. You never say you're from New York City. Yeah. It's just an interesting um, sort of dimension. But there's three. Yeah. So you have the city, you have the suburbs and you have the woods. The suburbs I find fascinating. By the way, you may hear my dogs bark in a second. Some people who follow me on Instagram and Twitter are bigger fans of my dogs than I am. So I apologize if we get interrupted by my dogs. Maybe when I come over, we'll pick them up and, and play. Um, but this, the, there's three things. So the suburbs are where I grew up. And uh, the suburbs are sort of what I consider the battleground of what we call the American dream. But really, it's the world dream. It's the place you want to go, you get married. You have 2.4 kids. You hopefully have a one or two car garage, picket fence, the things that you normally see. And where this dream comes true is a pretty ripe arena and fertile grounds to have it turn into a nightmare. Um, it's fragile. And we've seen that even more so over the last few years. So that's interesting to, to play yeah. with. Um, second, I grew up in a suburb, which was you know kind of a classic American suburb near Newark, New Jersey. I was born in Newark and then uh, we moved out to the suburbs. Um, we were the first people to live in that house. But there's also a lot of um, wooded area by my house. Mm -hmm. And my parents were not good at watching. Back in those days, who cared? But even when I was three or four, I would wander off. And I spent lots of time in the woods. And of course, 
anything could happen in the woods. And in my case, a lot of weird st stuff did happen. And so in a lot of my books, I find it um, an interesting, compelling place. It's, you know, here we are. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm near New York City. I'm in the most dense state in the United States, New Jersey, which is about the size of, of, uh, of Israel, uh, physically speaking, but extraordinarily dense. But in the woods, you're on your own. You know, there's, there's no one, you know, you're, you could walk for miles and miles and yeah. miles and not see anybody. So that working both of those together um, works for me. And your woods are almost uh, mythical in the sense that this is really the scary place. Um, but what I thought is that there are no monsters in the woods. I mean, in your woods, there are only real people who made mistakes. Um, your villains are seldom monsters. Um, is it because you don't believe monsters exist or because you don't think they make good fiction? I don't think they make good fiction. Um, I think they do exist, but I work as hard on making my villains as um, compelling as, Uh, as I do my my heroes and I, and I hope a lot of times most times at the end of the book you don't necessarily like the villain but you get where the villains coming from mm -hmm. um, you get the villains motive you wouldn't have done it but we could all see ourselves we all stand on that edge of the cliff at one point or another most of us don't slip off of it but some do uh, that to me is much more interesting than great evil I don't normally ser I don't do serial killers usually who cut up people for no reason that's just not my shtick yeah. I look at The difference between good and evil is sort of like, you know, you, you guys are big on soccer there. So like a line on the soccer field between out of bounds and inbounds, fair and foul, if you will. And in America, we lay them down with line. And if you trample on that line enough, it's very hard to see where you're inbounds and out of bounds. And I want to be as close to that line in fiction um, as I can. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, though, uh, I'm 59 years old and the last few years has shown me that real life villains are much more cartoonish. <laughs> I mean, there's just terrible people out there and more and more we see them every day um, that I would not have quite have imagined. I've been, I was a little naive. I've been, the joke I'd say is I've been working too hard on, on, my, too hard on my villains. Most villains are like Gaston or Jafar in a Disney film. There's no, there's not much complexity to them. They're just evil. Um, but I, I don't like that personally to read about. I don't find it particularly interesting to write about. I don't think you can learn too much from it. So I'll probably stay away from it. Okay. Let's go back to the 90s uh, when you began to write. Uh, I read somewhere that you weren't always dreaming about writing since you were a child. So where did the idea to write a book uh, came from? Well, I always loved story and I was always... Um, And I kind of liked writing, but I wasn't, I was actually a better math student than I was a um, better math and science student than I was an English student. Uh, when I was in college, I worked a couple summers in the Costa del Sol of Spain as a tour guide for like taking care of Americans who were on vacation there in the early 80s, this was. Um, not because I'm a brilliant linguist, but because my family owned the travel agency and they needed somebody to watch the shop in the summer. And at that time, especially, I mean, we've seen American tourists you know, in your country plenty of times, so you guys all know this. Americans on vacation, those buses back in those days, they were really kind of funny. They were scared. They didn't know what they were doing. They were, and I came back one year, my senior year of college, and I said, you know what? I want to write a book about this experience. I want to write a, a novel about what this was like. And I did. I, I'd never taken a writing class. I still was taking all the classes in school. I tried, in fact, to make it a thesis, and I asked a number of professors if I could do it as a thesis, but because I had not taken any English classes, no one would take me on. So I just wrote it in my spare time, sitting in front of a TV. And it was terrible. I mean, the books, I still have it somewhere upstairs. It can be published after I'm dead, I guess, but it's not good and awful. But from that, I got, I can only call it the writing bug, the writing virus. You're a writer, so you know what I'm talking about. You reach a stage where you have to continue doing this. You just... I don't know why. I don't know what the motive is. Um, I don't know what the, the, it's a strange contradiction in what we do, Gerard, you know, because on the one hand, I'm, I'm ragingly insecure, right? I'm writing these things going, oh my God, I'm awful. I'm terrible. Who's going to want to read this crap? Are you I still really thinking that? It. Oh yes, every day. But, but the side is part of that is you still have the hubris to say, someone's going to, spend 400 pages with me and actually pay me to do that. 
And you have those feelings that are contradicting each other yeah. at the same time. But yes, as a writer, and I, I, I tell me if you do the same thing. So I'm writing my book now, and there'll be days I'm writing this book going, oh my God, this is such crap. I was so good before. <laughs> what happened to me? How did I lose it? And then five yeah. minutes later, I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever written. This is just eh. Yeah. I hope they go through that so they can get, and that happens every day. And I know I talk to writers like Stephen King or whoever else. We're all that way. Only, yeah. only bad writers think they're good. <laughs> if, you, if you're interviewing a writer who's telling you how great they are, trust yeah. me, they suck. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is easy for Jews. We're always beating ourselves <laughs> up anyway this way. This is where I think being Jewish yeah. comes in handy. Yeah. Uh, was it, and was it clear from the beginning that it was going to be mystery fiction that you're going to write? You know, uh, it's, it's still not clear. I mean, yes, you mm -hmm. can call them mysteries, but they're not Agatha Christie kind of mysteries. Yeah, they're, they're, they're crime fiction. Um, you know, it's so funny because I've done about four or five of these, and the last one kept saying, well, you really you write suburban novels, novels about suburbia. I'm like, well, the Myron Bolotar series isn't suburbia. Yeah. Boy from the Woods is about really, you know, you can always, whatever I end up doing, I end up doing something different. I, I call, I guess they're thrillers. I, I guess they're suspense. Yeah. Um, but as far as crime novels go, I challenge anybody to name a great novel that's 100 years old, one of the great novels that, that doesn't have a crime. I mean, if you think of Oscar Wilde and Dostoevsky and Dumas, even Shakespeare, crime has always been a way of testing somebody, a character out. It's yeah. kind of only in today's world where a story that's plotless seems to be um, mainstream or literary. Again, think of all of your favorite novels, you know, Flaubert, whoever it is, you can't name one that, was just, that wasn't in some sense plot driven. That's not to say I'm writing Flaubert, which, yeah. you know, it's, but it's to say that that's the tradition um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I don't necessarily, you know, I like twists and turns. There's no question about it. I over twist and turn. But the important thing is that won't work unless you care or have emotion for these various characters. You mentioned tradition. So I, I want to ask you, so what writers, what crime writers did you grow up on? And do you feel a part of a tradition, you know, Chandler, Hammett, Stephen King, you mean, do you feel like a part of that great American tradition of crime, crime writing? Well, I do. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I wasn't that guy, though, who grew up reading the Hardy Boys. You know, we always had the American, oh, I grew up reading Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and uh, all that. Um, my, you know, I, I read mostly when I was a kid, Roald Dahl was, was big and C.S. Lewis's Narnia series and Madeline Langell, Wrinkle in Time. And I don't know if these books are over there or not. I imagine that they are. Um, it was more like I was about 15 or 16 when my father, the book I always say that started me on this path, was William Goldman's Marathon Man. And I was about 15 or 16. And my father gave me that book to read. It was my first, I think, adult thriller. And I remember thinking, you could put a gun to my head and I wouldn't put this book down. I, I just, you know, I, I didn't put it, I read it straight. And I, and I think subconsciously, even though at the time I didn't know I wanted to be a writer, but I thought, how cool would it be to do what William Goldman is doing to me for a living? I mean, how cool that must be. So I think that's it. And then, you know, Chandler, in my case, Robert B. Parker, who wrote the Spencer series, clearly Myron owes a debt of gratitude. I always joke when Robert Parker died in his obituary, uh, there was a quote from me saying 90% of modern crime writers admit that Robert Parker was an influence and 10% lie about it. Um, so Sue Grafton was an influence. Mary Higgins Clark, in terms of suspense, was an influence. Hitchcock films were an influence. Woody Allen's early films were an influence. Everything. Ed Hopper paintings are an influence. It shouldn't just be writers that influence you. Yeah. So in 1995, you, you published the first Myron Bolitor novel, um, Deal Breaker. Uh, where did you come up with the idea for a series in which the protagonist is a former basketball player and now an agent? That's quite unique. Actually, it wasn't my idea. My agent at the time had written a, tried writing a series many years earlier uh, with a sports agent. And he just felt at the time, remember, I had no contract. I had, wasn't making any money as a writer. And he said, why don't you try, just try making it a sports agent 
And at the time, this is why you should never jump on a trend, people. Um, at the time, Sue Grafton and Sarah Paretsky uh, and, all, and a lot of women writers were becoming big. So he said, make it a, try making a female sports agent. And I went home and I thought about it and Myron was just there. I mean, he's me with wish fulfillment, so it's not like he was that big of a stretch, but um, I didn't write what he suggested, but I, I took on my own spin and then I decided I always loved sidekicks, so I created Win, who was going to be in the office, well, Big Cindy and Esperanza, whatever it is, you kind of come up with it. Yeah. But that's sort of the origin is that I wanted to write something in the private eye tradition. But what I found, I shouldn't say lacking, that's not the right word. What I, what I wanted to combine was I had written already two standalone thrillers. Um, I loved the, the, the private eye, the, the Robert Parker, Spencer, or the Raymond Chandler kind of character, or the Sue Grafton one even. But sometimes I found that their characters were great, but their stories weren't necessarily as suspenseful. If I could do what I did with sort of standalone, kind of give it real plot, real mystery, real twists, but add this kind of interesting character that people fall in love with, that would be a really cool combination. Don't know if I accomplished it, but yeah. that was sort of what I was thinking I could, I could blend the two. Yeah. And Myron is Jewish. Um, so to what extent is it important to you that he is Jewish? Was it clear for you from the beginning that he must be Jewish? Um, he, because, you know, writers hate to admit this and you know, you know this because you're a writer. Um, but my, Myron was me with wish fulfillment. So I tried to keep him as close to me in many ways as I could. I played college basketball. I started on my college basketball team, but it was division three, which is small school. I was never drafted as a pro. So Myron's a much better basketball player. He's smarter. He's faster. He's better looking. He's stronger. He's a more loyal friend, et cetera. I haven't beaten two areas. One, I'm a better dancer. I won't demonstrate. Don't worry. And two, I'm wiser in the ways of women, which is no great shakes because Myron's a dope when it comes to women. But I, I, you know, I've been with my wife a long time and Myron's love life up until book 11 or so has been kind of a disaster. It's, it's pretty good now. Um, but when I created him, I also created a weird tension between us that has worked out for us. Myron has in life what I want and I have what Myron wants. So Myron's whole goal in life was to get married and move to the suburbs and have barbecues in his backyard and have a family. And I, that's sort of what I have. I have four kids. They're growing now. They're grown pretty much. But that was so Myron was always jealous of me. On the other hand, I lost my parents young. My mom was 60. My dad was 59. Um, so I never really got to see them age or change. Myron has that close relationship with his parents that I have a tendency, frankly, to overwrite, and I get melodramatic with it. Tough. It's my therapy. So I also thought it would be unusual because I'd never seen a detective series where the, de the detective is really close and loves his parents. So Myron's parents get to survive, and I'm jealous of that. Age and change and all the things that I see my friends have gone through with, with parents getting sick and older and having to take care of them, I didn't experience, but Myron will experience. Yeah. Do you think the fact that he's close to his parents has to do with the fact that he's Jewish? And, uh, uh, you know, if I can add to that, I'm asking in a way, would you consider yourself a Jewish writer? I mean, is it a part of your literary identity? I don't know. I'm not big on like, like you say, like, am I a crime writer? Am I a suspense mm -hmm. writer? Am I a thriller writer? Am I a Jewish writer? I don't know. Certainly a, a lot of my heroes tell no one, Dr. Beck, David Beck, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Will Klein. So there's plenty of um, Jewish heroes that I have in, in my novels, but I would, you know, I wouldn't call myself, I wouldn't call it necessarily a, a Jewish writer, um, and I'm and more secular certainly than than just religious. Um, and for Myron, for a long time, I actually, I I, I kept it kind of quiet. And when he there was a there was an early book where Myron is talking to a black police officer and her talking about entering a very fancy upscale club and the black, you know, they say, well, we wouldn't be welcome here. And people assume Myron must be black. I'm like, it's not just blacks that aren't letting these clubs people think a second. Um, so I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Okay. I, I started thinking while, you know, doing rereading of some of your books, if it's interesting for me, if there's such a thing as the Jewish American tradition of mystery writing from David Goodies to Harlan Coban, passing through Jonathan and Faye Kellerman and including maybe the Coen brothers and Fargo. 
Um, do you think such a thing exists or? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I mean, certainly Faye Kellerman and, and Jonathan are, 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 are they, you know, religion plays a much bigger role in their lives and in their books. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, okay. I, I know we're trying to find, I'm not, a, I'm not a great historian on, um, on any of this stuff. Uh, yeah. You know, I appreciate my, my, my forebears, if you will, mm -hmm. my forefathers, mm -hmm. but I don't really, I don't really have much of a strong opinion on that. Yeah. Okay. So you wrote more than 30 books. Um, and it's sometimes said about writers that all writers have only one story to tell. What is your story? <laughs> well, I guess I don't have one story to tell since I've written 30 of them. Um, so I don't know if I would uh, necessarily agree with them. I am big on, I mean, the themes I've always been fairly big on is family, um, loss, um, mm -hmm. suspense, uh, that sort of a thing. Those, those, the, the themes, I like the past coming back to get you uh, and that secrets and that nobody is exactly what they appear to be. Again, that human nature thing that always struck a chord with me. You think you know everybody else a little better than they know you, and we don't. And so when you think about that, that yeah. that's an interesting thing. That's sort of, if I could nail it all down, that's what it all comes down to. You mentioned that you played basketball, and uh, I guess you still follow basketball, right? A little bit, not as much are, as- are you, an, are you a Nets fan or a Celtics fan? Well, <laughs> growing up, I was a big Celtics fan. My dad was from Boston, and so I was a huge Celtics fan. Now I'm more of a uh, – right now, I guess I'd be a Nets fan because yeah. they're competitive, <laughs> exactly. and they're really good right now, and it's kind of yeah. fun. And the Nets used to be New Jersey's team, so yeah. – um, but I'm not really following it close enough. I, I stopped sort of cheering for teams – Sometime there's time in the late mid '80s or uh, where my, my the, the team I loved for baseball lost this big series. Uh, they were supposed to win, and it was a big, it was a, very close, and it was, and I actually kind of fell into a funk for a while afterwards. I'm like, why the heck are you feeling in a funk? I mean, that's the <laughs> dumbest thing in the world. Why do I care? You know what, what these people are doing, and so I stopped cheering as much for any team in any game. I just sort of enjoy it as much as I can. I don't care if they win or lose as much. So I, you know, I was younger. I I was a passionate, you know, cheering for my team. And every once in a while, you just go, "Why? You know, why do you cheer for your soccer team?" Ah, there was. I one hear you, dog. Yeah. yeah. Now, now what I wanted to ask you about about basketball is, you know, you know that good players. Uh, evolve during their career? I mean, when they get old, they change their game. Um, do you feel your writing has evolved? And in what way during these 30 years of writing? It has. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, there's, I never, I never reread my own books. I mean, why would I? It's torture. Um, you always hate your old stuff. And that's not being hard on myself. It's sort of like everybody out there who's listening. There was a paper you wrote at unit when you were in university or high school that you thought was brilliant. And then you're, you find it now and you reread it and you go, oh, it's terrible. What did I, because mm. what did that kid know? What did, you know, what did you know when you were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? So I'm very, very hard on my old stuff and think I'm better now. doesn't mean I am. Yeah. Uh, with the Netflix series, I often have to go back and not just reread old books, but really study them, break them down, figure it out. And there's both good and bad, I find. I had more energy then. I was a little more bonkers, willing to really take some wild risks in terms of plotting. And you know, some books have 30 different viewpoints in them. I don't think I would do that now. Um, I think I'm a little better on emotion now than I was then. But I don't, you know, again, I'm not the one to answer these, that, that kind of question. Yeah. Who's better now? What did I change now? That, that I always Are, are there things that come easier to you now in writing? Some things come easier. Transitions come easier. You know, I can get person from point A to point B easier. Mm -hmm. um, how to, getting in and out of scenes, perhaps easier. But actually writing is no easier and maybe harder. Yeah. Um, the comparison I kind of make, and it fits and it doesn't fit. If you can imagine a, 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 a field mm -hmm. of really super tall grass, and the first novel, you're going in with a hacksaw and you're hacking your way through and you don't know where you're going. So you're going all over to get to the other side. And eventually 
you find your way to the other side, right? It was impossibly hard. Well, the second novel, you got to go back to the start. You got to do the same thing, but you can't take the route you've already taken, right? So you're hacking through. It's a little harder because you can't follow the route you've done before. Yeah. It's a little easier because you've done it. You know, eventually you'll get there. And then repeat that again a third time and a fourth time. So it's easier and harder. And the, to really stretch this analogy out, every once in a while, I need to replenish my brain so I can grow some more stuff up. Um, so you learn from experience, but I have found that no book is easier than the one before. They're all the same torture. My wife laughs at me. There's always the stage where I go, oh my God, this isn't working. Uh, uh, this, this book, uh, well, you know what? I'm due to have one bomb. I'll be all right. And then, oh my God, I love this book so much. Oh my God, I hate this. All that goes, I go through the same process every book. And it's a little bit like childbirth. You kind of forget the pain and how you did it the time before. So I don't know if how much I do it this way each time. Uh, I read that you, when you start writing, uh, you don't know how the plot will develop. You know the beginning and the end. Um, and I wanted to know if you still learn things while writing. I mean, about yourself, about the craft of writing crime fiction. Um, but the craft, I don't know. Because mm -hmm. I, I still, it's, I, I'm not a craft guy, so I don't really know. I just tell the best story I can, however that goes. But I certainly get surprised a lot um, in the stories. And people pop up and situations pop up that I don't expect. And that's usually when the novel's going its best. So again, I do. I compare it to traveling from my home state of New Jersey, if you look on a map, to LA. There's a direct highway, Route 80, that you can do it. And I'll start off on Route 80, but I won't stay on Route 80. I may go via the Suez Canal by the time I'm done, but I'll end up in LA. Um, and sometimes some of those uh, places, I know a few that I'm going to stop at along the road. I know where I'm going to get gasoline or whatever. But when I'm surprised at where I go is usually when the novel is working its best, when a character or just shows up or something happens that you don't expect, a new detour, a new block, it's not as easy as you want it to be for your character, that's usually when the novel starts to come to life. Yeah. Um, we mentioned uh, Chandler and his generation, and you know they invented a certain style. How important is style to you? I mean, how would you define it? Is it is it less important in mystery writing or you know thriller writing than it than today than it was then? My guess is it's it's more important um, in being a popular uh, crime thriller writer, whatever you want to call it, uh, to have a, to have that voice than ever. And I think it's true of, of all writing. So, so uh, an agent, an early agent of mine, friend of mine, told me one time that she can pick up any really successful crime writer or any writer, not just the crime writer, any writer's books, read one page and know who wrote it. So Philip Roth, for example, right? You read a page of Philip Roth, you know Philip Roth wrote that. I hope it's the same, even though I change up and this particular book win is from a very different viewpoint, but you do need a voice. Uh, you can start if you're trying to write your voice by copying a favorite writer, often people do. But you have to have your own voice. Uh, I think that's part of the appeal. You know, I'm trying to, my style is to be very conversational. I want to be sitting at a table with you. I sometimes want to step out of the story and talk to you directly. I know that's against the rules, but I do it. I don't know, I'm not good with rules. When I wrote Tell No One, which was my first big bestseller, I started it in first person from Beck's viewpoint. And about 50 or 60, 70 pages, I'm like, geez, I got to leave this. I got to go third person. And everyone said, well, you can't do that. You can either do first person or third person. And some people can do one chapter first, one per chapter third. But my, the book ended up being, I would say, two thirds first person, one third, third person. There was no rhyme or reason to when I would go into the third person. But once you kind of know the rules, you can break them. So that's part of voice. You have to have your own voice. Um, and you have to have a voice that is appealing to you and to the reader. Um, I, I think that you know the, the good thrillers uh, can be about you know what frightens us as human beings, sometimes as societies. And I'm, I was wondering, you know, are the things that frighten America has changed 
since the 90s? I mean, are you writing about different things, different frightening things than you were writing 30 years ago? Yes and no. I mean, missing people are, are, are going to be compelling whenever you write about that. You're, again, I do a lot with family dynamics. It's not like people care less for their family yeah. now than they did in the 1990s. The technology changes, the politics change, the settings change. And I try, well, I don't really try to do it this way. I try to be very specific so I can be universal. That sounds, again, like a contradiction, but it's not. So my books take place here in New Jersey. They're very New Jersey, New York oriented. And yet I sell more books overseas than I sell here. Um, and my friends in New Jersey are always like, why do people like who live in, in Israel like a book that is, is taking place in New Jersey? And it's because I, I think that the, those sort of emotions um, are more universal. It's also why with the Netflix series, I love setting them in other places. That hybrid fascinates me. Yeah. Um, so the next one that comes out, uh, that'll be in Israel too, The Innocent, is Netflix Spain. We filmed it mar mostly in Barcelona and a little bit in Malaga. And um, I love that hybrid feeling. I, I think that makes it, makes it shine. So um, let's, let's talk about television. You mentioned uh, Netflix. Netflix. I mean, does it in television, you know, first as, as, you know, viewers, I mean, television is so present in our lives today. Does it influence us as writers? Did it influence you as a writer, you think? There's, there's only one answer to this from any writer who's 70 and younger, and that is yes. And any writer who says no is a liar. I'm just going to say it right out. Any, li any, liar who, any writer who says just wants to sound smart. That's the writer who says to you, oh, who influenced me? Um, Keats and uh, Yeats and Shakespeare, like they haven't read anything that was written in the last 20 years. Yeah. That's bullshit. And frankly, it's just, it's just a lie. Yeah. We all grew up on TV. I grew up on TV. You grew up on TV. Yeah. I know some of you had that house that had no TV. I, I really don't believe you. I'm sorry. I don't believe you. Yeah. So our writing and the way we see the world is influenced by TV and movies. Of course, those were influenced by books. Yeah. So it's, it's not that big a deal to say that. It's a cyclical nature. But um, is your, was your writing influenced by, you know, in, in recent years, by the fact that you started writing more and more for television? No, yeah, that's the opposite. So I never, I never write a book saying, oh, this is going to make a great adaptation. Mm -hmm. And a book is very, very different than a TV series and should be. And that's why I allow my adaptations. And when I work at them, I'm usually the one who suggests them to be very, very different because the time period may be different and things that work on the screen and, on the, and in a book are different. So years ago, they asked James Cain, who wrote The Postman Rings Twice and Double Indemnity, don't you hate what Hollywood has done to your books? And he said, they ain't doing anything in my book. It's right here. So I don't want you to have the exact same experience as a book. I think the worst adaptation, adaptations stay slavishly devoted to the text. If you want the exact experience of the book, read the book. Um, some things don't work well visually. When I, we were making the movie Tell No One, which is a very was a popular French movie directed by Guillaume Canet. Um, Guillaume had, like there's scenes in the book that took, took place at black tie events. And Guillaume says to me, those don't film well. And I go, I agree with you. He goes, I have a real background that I'm a horse jumper. I, I want to have these charity events at horse jumping events that you don't have in the book. I'm like, that's, that's better. But it's not better for a book because who wants to read me explain about horses for 20 pages? Yeah. That's, what I, that's what I mean. They're different mediums. And yeah. what works visually, the biggest example I can give you, which a lot of people have seen on Netflix, The Stranger. In the book, The Stranger is sort of a nerdy white computer geek. Uh, that worked in a book. But when I was, we were filming it, and it wasn't to be politically correct, it just didn't look right. We had some people come in and we tried them out in that first scene when we're talking to Richard Armitage. And I said, no, we need a woman. And we need a really a hip looking woman who can just lay it out for him. And Hannah John came and came in and slaughtered it. And so we changed the, we changed the gender of the stranger. Yeah. Not because I was being politically correct or anything like that, but because it works better on the screen than, than, than on a page. So um, should writers, um, you know, fiction writers, uh, should, try, should they try to write for television? 
Um, can they learn something from writing for television? I think all writing helps. You know, my friend, my friend Michael Conley, who's a very popular crime fiction writer, he wrote for years for the LA Times and as a crime reporter. I think, you know, that helps. A lot of my, a lot of my writer friends were journalists. And there you learn how to get to a deadline, you know, and all that. I think that helps. Any writing helps. Does specifically TV writing help? I don't know. I haven't seen that many uh, screenwriters make the transition to novelists. So I don't know. They're, they're similar and they're different. The key is, is telling the story. Yeah. You know, if we um, I want to ask you a last question, um, going back to basketball again, you know, experienced basketball players, when they're like over 35 or something, they're often asked, when are they going to take their shoes off? Um, writers don't have that uh, age limitation. Uh, but do you sometimes think, I wrote many novels, I succeeded, I made money, I told all the stories I wanted to tell, maybe I should stop? Or is it too difficult to imagine your life without writing? Um, well, right now, maybe that day will come. That day hasn't come yet. Part of it is I'm not a very interesting or diverse person. I don't have hobbies. I don't have, uh, you know, I play a little bit of golf, but I don't collect things. I don't have a real strong interest in antiques. Um, so this is kind of all I have. I, my life has been either my kids and my family or my writing. The kids are grown now. Yes. So if anything, I have more time to write, not less. So I don't know what I would, I don't know what I would do yeah. with myself. I'll tell a quick story of a fame. There's a, I won't mention either one's names, two, two rock stars who were friends quite famous. And one of them um, got really into Persian rugs, right? Bought two or three houses because he had a lot of money and started filling with Persian rugs. And on Sundays, he would go and look at Persian rugs and studying on Persian rugs. And as my other, the other rock and roll star told me, he did so much with Persian rugs, he forgot to make music. <laughs> right? That's not good. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to get interested in Persian rugs. This is one of the few things I do well. I love doing it. I love the reaction. Um, I still get it. You know, this book just came in. I just got the other day the box of books. And still, after all this time, It's a thrill to open that box and pull this out. I hope I'm able to travel a little bit to see this book in a bookstore or an airport. That thrill doesn't <laughs> go away. And I've added to the thrill now by being able to work on these Netflix shows. You know, The Stranger's Out, The Safe is Out, um, The Innocent, The Woods, The Polish Show is out, uh, which was an interesting adaptation. We'll have The Innocent out, is it coming out in April 30th? Gone for Good will be out this year from Netflix France. That's fun. That's, you know, that's still cool. So I don't know what else I would do with myself. So just continue, you know, just continue tell us, telling us stories in thank many you, forms. <laughs> And thank you very much for, you know, coming here to Jerusalem or, <laughs> you know, almost uh, to, talk to, the, to talk to us in the Jerusalem Writers Festival. Thank you very much, Harlan. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.